Okay, we're continuing our discussion of continuous distributions of charge. The last video had an example of a thin rod. And so that was this one. And now I wanna talk about arcs or rings. So arcs and rings are basically, you can think of a ring as being an arc that completes the circle. And so we're gonna continue in this vein of using a point charge formula then we're going to use a differential charge dq, a tiny amount of charge dq, and then we're going to do this integral. So I want to look at 22.20 .20 on page 22. And I've got that drawn up right over here. I think this is page 20. What did I just say? Page 22? Yes. All right. So uh let's just get into it i know i want to use uh I, and so for this problem to be clear i don't want the electric field at the origin i want to get the electric field at this point now here i'm assuming this ring is uh symmetric uh, and we're looking at some point on axis so sometimes i'll say this i would say distance z on axis from ring now, you might be saying, how would I handle off axis? Code it. But let's first learn how to do a paper and pencil calculation here. All right. Now, in this case, I know I want to take, I want to split this into a bunch of tiny chunks. And I want to get the contribution from each of these chunks. If you wanted to see a visualization of this, maybe I'll show you that real quick. Maybe that will help you understand what I'm doing here. Let's run this one. So right, we're gonna be basically building up arcs like this, or in this particular problem, I think we're doing this one. We're building up the electric field out of an entire ring. Now in this particular one, I put a point charge in the middle. We don't really need to have that point charge at the, at the middle right now. We're just gonna try and figure out running this again, how to get the contributions from all those red charges that are forming the ring and after we get that, we could discuss how to animate it. All right. So hopefully that helped you visualize this. We're trying to build up this ring. And first, let's just get the electric field at some point. All right. Now, uh, the equation for that is the electric field at P is equal to the sum or the integral of all the contributions. Each contribution is coming from a point charge. K, I'll put it in red, dq times r vector over r cubed. In this case, notice how critical it is that we pay attention to capitalization, just like in coding. Capital Q is the total charge. Capital R is the radius of the entire ring. R, this R is not big R. They are not the same. And you're going to hear me say little r and big R over and over again in this class. It's crucial that we pay attention to capitalization. In this case, let's imagine we just take one particular chunk. And for no good reason, I'm going to choose this one. Let's say this is my particular choice of DQ. The R vector is from what to what? It's from the source. The source charge is DQ to the point of interest. All right, and maybe I'll put that in black so it seems out. So I do not want to go towards the origin anymore. I want to get the electric field at P. So I start here and I end up there. Notice that is not big R. Now it's convenient to choose this point because I can see it better over here. If this is the one particular DQ I want to analyze to start, ooh, maybe I should have put that Z on the other side. I'm going to do that. Okay, 
And we're told the following information. We know the radius of the ring is big R, and I know that I'm on axis distance Z above the ring. That is my R vector. In this case, if I use this particular coordinate system here, notice I'm going in R in the what? Uh, negative, oh, look, we could say that's radius. Oh, I don't want to go that way yet. Let's just say for this particular case, it's negative R in the J hat. Because remember, in this problem, X is kind of out of the page. So that would be this is negative J hat and then Z in the K hat. I want to make sure this is mimicking my solution. Let me just check something here. Yeah, this is the same way I solved it in the solution. So if you want to follow along with the solution instead of me, you can do it. All right. So, all right. At this point, it's pretty straightforward. Notice that R would equal R squared plus Z squared to the three half. Oh, not to the three half. You can tell where I'm going with that, though. The one half. So now when I plug this stuff in, I get a K, DQ, oh crap, we didn't figure out what DQ is. Well, I'm gonna remind you, we need to write use density to write that. So let's go back to our density board. For a thin rod, we were using lambda times DX. For a thin arc and a ring, so an arc or a ring, we would use lambda radius d theta so if it helps you could think of this term here as arc length if you imagine a small portion of a circle let me just draw a circle here let's say i start at this angle theta and then i change by a tiny angle d theta so the angle right there is not theta, it's a tiny change in angle. The length associated with that tiny change is r d theta. So that's why it's not r times theta, we're using a tiny angle, so we get a tiny portion of the ring, so we get a tiny portion of the charge, so that this equation is valid. Again, we use a tiny chunk of the ring, that's why we have d theta, and that's why we get r d theta. Crucial that you get that. So make sure you think it through. All right, out of all this, the whole point of that was when we're doing these arcs and rings, we'd write lambda r d theta. The r vector is This term is going to raise that to the three halves. Most students are starting to crap their pants about now thinking this is going to stink. Turns out this is a piece of cake. Just watch. It's important to know what's constant and not constant in an integral if you want to save yourself a lot of headaches. All right. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good here. We've got the integral set up. Let's think about the limits before we go on. I'm going to start with this point charge, and I'm going to do every single point charge for this particular arc. It's a full ring. So I need to use every possible charge as I go around. I'm integrating over theta. So what is the angle as you go all the way around? Most people think in degrees, and most people want to say it's 360 degrees. But hopefully you remember in calculus, we're not going to use degrees, we need to use radians. So all the way around would be going from zero to pi. So that's our integral. You might be saying, how do I know I'm doing a theta integral? Because I got a d theta, not dx, not dy, I'm doing a theta integral. Now, uh, let's point some stuff out. Before you do the integral, 
a lot, the last problem, lambda popped right out because we had a uniform rod. Let's verify. I think in this problem, actually, I said it right here. In this problem, we could also pop out lambda as a constant, but I think it's crucial that you understand what lambda is. In particular, if the total charge on the ring is Q and the radius of the ring is R, what is lambda? Lambda is Q total over length total. Well, for this one, the total charge on the ring is Q. What's the total length? The roundest knight at King Arthur's table is circumference. This is really bad that I'm telling jokes to myself on Zoom when no one's around for no good reason. Hopefully that keeps you awake. I, I've made a lot of these videos today. I'm starting to lose my mind. Okay. Uh, what was the point? I know what lambda is now. I can shove that in, but we can clearly see that it's a constant. Why is this a better form? The givens in problem 22.20 were Q and R. Lambda was not a given, therefore we're rewriting lambda in terms of given quantities. That's the standard procedure you're supposed to follow for physics problems. All right, now wait a minute. Something's wrong here. This integral is technically not correct. What about the next DQ? Is the next DQ, let's say I chose this one, or this one, or this one. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Think, which part of the integral is not valid for every other charge? K is a constant, that's valid. Lambda and R, those are constants d theta, that's what we're going to integrate over. Is the distance the same for each of these points? Well, the distance in is going to be radius in, z up. So this is the correct distance. But this is not valid for every single point. Ah, shoot. Right? Sometimes we're not going in the j-hat. Sometimes we're going positive j-hat. Sometimes a mix of i-hat and j-hat. Crap. I guess we should give up, quit physics, and move on and just change our lives forever. Oh, wait! Oh, wait! Good news. Let's think here. I know that this DQ is going to cause an electric field this way, right? So this is DE from number one. So I'm going to call this DQ1. What about this charge over here? Let's call that DQ2. Now remember, how do you get the direction of the electric field? Pretend you put a plus charge here. If this is a plus charge, that would push it this way. Well, wait a minute. Which term is going to drop out? If I add up every single contribution all the way around the ring, this one is in the positive j-hat, this one's in the negative j-hat. Remember, in this problem, j-hat is to the right. So unfortunately, this is not x anymore. This is y and z. So let's label that just so it's clear. This is the y direction. This is the z direction. So we're not talking x and y anymore. Y and z. Trying to follow the convention in some common textbooks. The j hat components drop. So what I'm going to do is just write j hat and the i hats drop by symmetry. You can see now why we were practicing symmetry so much. It makes our integrals easier. Think about it. For every point here, there's a point diametrically opposed, which will cancel out its i hat or j hat or both contributions. Right? If there's a point here in the positive x, there's a point in the negative x, which would cancel out the i hat. So any term that has an i hat or j hat will not survive integration. And that makes this problem now a valid integral. If we ignore any i hat or j hat terms, the integral will work out, even though we're not actually writing the right r vector. It's crucial that you do this step, thinking about symmetry, before you do the integral. 
Likewise, it's crucial to think about lambda before you do the integral. What if it's non-uniform? If it's non-uniform, it's not a constant, it doesn't factor out. All right. Now, this integral at first glance looks horrible, but let's think. What factors are constant? Think. I'll give you a second. Okay. You can pause the video if you need to. In this case, we're integrating over theta. Does constant k depend on theta? No. Does the density depend on the angle? No. Does the radius? No. Does the height above the? No. Does k? Have... No. Nothing depends on theta here. So this is actually the easiest integral you're going to get. Everything pulls out except for d theta. So we get k lambda r z k hat. Let's see. k lambda r z k hat. And we're going from zero to two pi. Well, this whole term, in this case, it's always important to check the zero limit, but this is going to be theta evaluated at zero and two pi. So this whole integral goes to two pi. So our final answer is two. Oh, wait a minute. We should plug in what lambda is too. Remember that lambda is q over two pi r. So when I do that, this two pi will cancel that two pi. This r will cancel that r. And so what do we get? We can simplify this. You could take more time at home. You could pause the video, do the algebra. You should do it, okay? Pause the video, do it. Now check with me. Let's see, we're gonna get a k, q, z, k hat. Has. Now, what should we check? A couple of things. Okay, think. What should you check? Check it. You can pause the video and do your own check. Here I go. Okay, check the units. I'm going to do an advanced style of checking the units. I'm going to write down any old formula I know. I know the electric field for a point charge is KQR squared. Uh, kq over r squared times r hat. I know that this has no units. So I know that should be what the form looks like. I need a k on top. I need a q on top. And then I need a net meter squared on bottom. Well, look at this. I've got meters squared. I've got meters over meters squared to the three halves. k hat has no units. This is looking good, right? This is going to be meters over meters cubed. And I don't know if that's showing up. Give me just a sec. Just barely, okay? So that's the idea here. All right, and so the units check out. Great, the units check. What else? The direction. Okay, according to this, everything in here would be positive. Z was in the positive Z axis. So when I look at this, we're looking at a positive number k hat. Does that make sense? You got positive charges everywhere here. We expect the electric field should be upwards. That makes sense. Looking good. Finally, do you remember last time, the last check that's a little bit more advanced, but still doable? What if you're really far away? In this problem, if you're really far away, which number gets big? Z. If Z is really huge, this would look like a point charge, right? Well, take a look. If Z is really big, this term is huge. That term drops out. I get Z cubed. I have a Z here. I get KQ over Z squared. It looks like a point charge far away. Okay, all of our three checks still work out. All right. And then, all right. Have we beat this problem to death? I feel like we have. All right. So remember, 
why are we doing this? This at first seems crazy. Let me go back to that simulation now. Where is that? Here it is, share screen. Where was that one? This one? This one. So the idea is, imagine we have this ring of charge and we're looking at it. The idea is we're getting, uh, let me do my annotations here. Whoa, crap. Let me move this here, move this here. The idea is we can figure out the electric field, which is this term right here. That's the electric field. And then I could put, for example, let's just say I put a negative charge here. Oh, that's hard to see. Let's say I put a negative charge right there. So then I could get the force on that negative charge that would equal man I, I'm, slow, I'm, I'm I'm just being bad here I need to color code this correctly sorry about that the electric field is in yellow in this problem so I should probably write it in yellow and then in this case our charge was negative Q, if I use a negative charge with magnitude Q, notice the force would be downwards. And that's why when I was running this code earlier, you saw it bouncing up and down. So what are we really doing here? Let's, let's run this code again. Hopefully you can remember the color coding. The idea is the yellow arrow is the electric field, and we use that to calculate the force, and then we use the force to animate the motion. So inside the code, what does that look like? Right? You get the electric field. for Basically, you write a for loop, and you just, each time the ball moves inside your while loop, you just crank through the R vectors, get the electric field from each point charge and notice it looks really simple in coding and then you just get the force and then you do the same old euler cromer method that we've been doing for for forever here um let's stop uh yeah um and may, actually maybe let's do that all right so now i feel like we beat this to death the whole point of this is maybe we want to use this electric field over and over again this one is so common it's actually now that we've derived it, you might laugh. It's actually given to you on your exam equation sheet somewhere right there. And so this is one of the few formulas that I may actually ask you to derive and show your work. So um, this is a good derivation to actually practice and know. You may actually be asked to show this. You may not. I don't know. Um, but just keep this in mind. You should know how to do this derivation to understand it. The other thing that we do is sometimes we use this result in other problems, right? So you can imagine it's fairly easy in the real world to get a ring of charge. There we go, we got some charge on this now. And then you can use this to exert forces on things. And we saw a convenient aspect of this is that there's a force on the axis in the middle that we could use to control something's motion. All right. Where else do we want to go with this? Another thing that we want to do, this was an entire, this was the simplest possible arc. The simplest possible arc is the ring for this reason. By symmetry, everything drops out so we can solve a large number of cases. But what if, let me show you another screen share. Let's do this one. What if I wanted to figure out this one? And let's run it again, just so you could see it. The idea is, we need to take each of these spheres and start adding them up. And we could get the net electric field from everything on an arc. And notice this one is more complicated, running it again. We see that sometimes the components cancel, but sometimes they won't. All right, and so how would we handle this? Let's just sketch this through here and maybe I could squeeze it in over there on that chunk of the whiteboard. Let me see here. Okay. 
So just so I have some room, there's this. That's enough. Let's just do it all. Like more to work out. Let's do this. Okay. Marker. So I'm going to start. This one's not in the workbook, but I just want to get to so arc information. Right? And let's start with an arbitrary, let's just say we have some chunk here. Trying to make this circular. Okay. And then So imagine you take a piece of plastic and charge it up and then bend it into this shape. Okay. And remember, with all of these continuous distributions of charge, we make the assumption that they're positive because afterwards we can always plug in a negative number. So let's say total charge Q. And let's say we go from some initial angle, I'll call that theta initial. We go to some final angle, theta final. One thing that I've already mentioned, what units do you need for these angles if we're gonna do calculus? That's kind of a crappy look at art, but I hope it's good enough for you to understand. <laughs> it's like still going upwards here. We use our angles in radians. Why? Radians have no units. If we want arc lengths and things to make sense, we need this to work out. We're going to look at a tiny chunk. So this would be dq. And maybe I'll, just to make this look a little bit prettier, let's make it a little bit wider so it's easier for me to label, okay? Obviously, this would be too large, probably, but let's say this is our DQ. This DQ subtends a tiny little angle, D theta. So notice theta would be the angle I'm located at. D theta is the angle subtended by this chunk of the arc. In general, we said this already, it should be some lambda times r d theta, where this is the arc length of the ring. r is the radius of the ring. So this is supposed to be a, a ring. Again, a little funky looking. All right. I cannot stress this enough. You need to pay attention to the difference between DQs and Qs, capital R's and lowercase r's, D thetas and thetas. In this case, our integrals end up looking like this. K, DQ, And then the R vector, notice this is a lowercase r. More on that in a second. This is the thing that drives me nuts.
students don't listen at this point or don't practice it enough to get this spot right. Remember, capital R is the radius of the arc. What does lowercase r mean in this freaking formula? R is from something to something. It's from the source, which is DQ to the point of interest. And to be fair, almost always this is the origin for this type of problem. Why? Because every other problem is too hard to get done in a test time. It's pretty easy if you're doing it in a computer program like I just showed you. But on a paper and pencil test, nobody can do this off, off origin that I can think of. If they are, it's not that bad. Maybe you'd set it up and not solve it. It's just a K hat term that sucks. Whatever. Okay, in this case, remember we're going, and maybe I'll color this. Let me give this some other color here. Let's see this one. Now yeah, whatever. Let's just let's use red. That's opposite the convention I was using earlier, but it doesn't matter. So in this picture, you know what? I'm going to do it. I think previously we used this with red, didn't we? Just so this matches all of the other ones. Sorry about that. So our integral is going to be dq, and then we need r vector, and I think that's how we did every other problem. So can we please do them the same? Yes, Rob. Yes, that's a good idea. Notice we're going from the source dun, 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 to the point of interest. And notice in this particular problem, The capitalization is crucial. I'm going in the negative r hat direction. Watch out. r hat is a great way to describe this. This means negative r hat means radially inwards. Unfortunately, R hat changes as you do the integral. If you put R hat in here, this is not going to work. Okay? So it would not be a constant. We couldn't pop it out. Let me give you an example here. So let's say we're at some arbitrary point, right? This point is uh, R away the vector to get here would be r cosine theta in the i hat plus r sine theta in the j hat if this is theta and this is r okay r cosine theta r sine theta i'm assuming a normal x y well what is capital R hat here? That would be take the R vector and divide by the magnitude. Now, in this case, this is going to work for you. We could now plug in R vector. Notice I'm switching to lowercase r is minus that. And maybe to make this consistent, I should do this. So R hat in this picture, capital R hat would be radially outwards. Negative R hat would be radially inwards. R should match this. Now think. 
why is this a better R vector to use than that? This looks so much simpler. The reason is simple. I had and J had R constant in the integral and factor out. So if you tried to plug this in, you're going to get the wrong answer every time. Whereas if you plug in this, I had and J hat will factor out in its feet. So running this forwards, this is a tough problem, isn't it? Let's see why I did it last. Fortunately, the distance from every single point, as long as we're going to the origin, which is what we usually do, the distance is capital R. The magnitude is capital R, and so we're going to cube that. Now notice what happens to this integral. We see that there's going to be an R squared on top, and R cubed on bottom. If lambda is uniform, great. If not, plug in some function. But we're going to get a K lambda over R times D theta. And notice the unit vector actually matters in the integration. Crap. In this problem, I'll just maybe try to emphasize this with some color here. We could plug in theta initial and theta final. And then remember, you can't use degrees. You got to use radians. And usually, these problems require us to figure out lambda. So sketching that out. Well, uh, and I should be clear, if this is uniform, we could do this. So if you have a uniform arc, what's the total length? It's the radius times theta final minus theta initial. Maybe I'll put that in green so it stands out. Sorry if you red, green, colored line, my bad. Just run down the colors. Now, I could tell I'm getting tired and maybe didn't do the, the most ideal job here, but all the facts are straight. So maybe let's do one more rundown just in case. If you have an arc, there's a lot more to think about. We need to distinguish between d theta, theta, little r, r, lambda, q, etc. And so in this case, the charge density, if it's uniform, we do the total charge over the total arc length, which may not be 2 pi r. It's r times some. We need to use angles and radians, or this equation doesn't make sense. The total electric field is k dq r vector over r cubed. And then we remember, oh, crap, it's good. Oh. I've got to fix something up here. We're saying, look, I need to go from the source to the origin in these problems. That's why I'm going this way, not outwards. That's why it's negative r hat. Well, r hat is going to be cosine theta and sine theta. And so we get this term here. When I plug that all in, I get this looking integral. Before you do any math, think. Usually, there is some symmetry in a problem. OK? The symmetry of the problem may tell us that the i hat part or the j hat part drops out. Use that symmetry information before you integrate to reduce the number of integrals you have to do. Okay? Um, Finally, watch out. If lambda is non-uniform, you can't just factor it out. So if lambda is non-uniform, you would 
you couldn't use this, you'd have to use some formula and it would probably be some function of theta. If you're wondering for some good problems to practice this, let's see what we got. Pages 24 and 25 have some arcs on it. Okay, there's some problems in there. Immediately, you see that there are some challenges. In my experience from reading various textbooks, instructors will show you this derivation and then be like, all right, let's see how they handle a messed up coordinate system. So page 25 discusses coordinate systems. And uh, in coding, Man, this is the coordinate system you want to use. The default system is use X and Y, and theta is determined from this axis. But in various problems, I show you how to handle this. So make sure when you're looking at problems, you look carefully at both pages 24 and 25 and learn how to handle problems with the angles to the vertical versus to the horizontal. And again, these are standard looking problems that are in a number of textbooks. It's not just me that does this weird stuff of messing with you in terms of the angles and where they're located. I think that's pretty good.